So you have to distract yourself with a job that only requires half your mind, which is why people have a lot of the best ideas in the shower, cutting the grass, doing the ironing, doing the washing up, stuff you don't really need your whole conscious brain on. This is The Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times. It's hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This second series is about all the aspects the FT organization is covering today, from editorial to development, from data to talent. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is a guide we designed to inspire you to be the one driving innovation and change. Welcome to the show. Another episode of our talent show by FT Talent. And I'm here in the podcast studio with Jonathan Black. How are you, Jonathan? Very well. It's great to be here. It's lovely to have Jonathan because uh, I have seen a few people so aligned in what they are doing with what we are trying to do at FT Talent because Jonathan is the working careers columnist here at the Financial Times. He writes with Dear Jonathan Callum and he's also the director of the University of Oxford's career service. How are you, Jonathan? And uh, Tell us a bit more about your career. Oh, my own career. Uh, well, in a way, I had a squiggly career since um, 1977. Uh, so I studied engineering at Cambridge um, and went into engineering in aircraft manufacturing, but then moved into computer sales for three years, moved again into management consultancy, both first in the UK and then in California, and then left that and joined publishing and a big multimedia operation in Los Angeles. And then we came back to the UK, and after a few years, I then did a startup, uh, which we sold to Elsevier, and then moved to Oxford, and then, after one thing and another, fell into this job. How did this happen? What made a very businessy driven journey, career path, go into a bit more intellectual kind of job? That is the one you're doing here at FT, but I guess with a career service perspective, you have a very pragmatical view on the future of work. Yeah, so what's the theme through all of that? I think it's uh, engineering. So I think it's the engineering theme. And the thing about engineers is they know the world isn't perfect. It doesn't fit together properly, so you have to have tolerances. But they also know about getting jobs finished. You can't have a bridge that's 98% finished. It has to be 100 So sometimes, So I think that has permeated uh, a lot of the um, career paths and the things I've done uh, with a love of getting things done and making a difference in the world, I suppose, that, you know, to, to people's careers. And yes, it's moved from a very analytical, quantitative sort of job, computer programming and, the, and management consultancy, which was very data-driven, and then gradually bringing on the more um, humanist literary side, I suppose, and then having to learn the craft of, of journalism with some, frankly, wonderful editors here who... You know, you send in what you think is perfect copy and it comes back better every time. You have a, you had a very international career as well. You have been uh, going in different places and continents, right? And uh, I just uh, found out that you speak many languages. I mean, the management consultancy, I was out of the London office, but never in London. So working in the Netherlands, in Germany, in um, Italy, and then moving to the US and, and working in the US for six years. I think that's extraordinarily... Uh, important and enriching. Uh, and all of this, of course, feeds forward into uh, future career decisions and, and you pick up different uh, an appreciation of different cultures and, and what plays well and what doesn't and understanding people's uh, different views of things. How did you land at the Financial Times after such a career? How did you convince maybe the editors and the newsroom that you would have been a great columnist and writer and topic editor? A great question. Um, every time uh, a journalist calls uh, when in my Oxford job, um, I make it a policy that you have to reply within two hours, if you're going to reply at all. Some of them you say, no, I'm not, we don't want to take that story. This one we do. But I know that journalists move on quickly, so you've got two hours to respond. And frankly, every time um, Emma Jacobs would call, I'd find some data or we'd find and I would respond to Emma. And then one time... Um, I said, oh, I see that uh, Lucy Kellaway is moving on. If ever you need anybody to do questions on careers and stuff, just let me know. And she said, are you serious? And then I thought, what have I just said? And so, you know, then I, I came up to London, had coffee with Emma and her then boss. And um, 
they said, let's write a, let's do an example one. Well, the example one got published. So we were sort of off and running. And that was five and a half years ago now. This is very, very interesting. And so you, if you had to describe um, your topic editor job, how does your, look, your day look like? Huh. Um, well, the editor role is a lovely, um, every two weeks, a lovely bit that's, that's sort of, um, it's like a sort of cherry on the cake every couple of weeks. You think, oh, great, I can step out of the day job and think, what's this, what's this issue? I, then I think about it for a couple of days, you cycle around, it's in the back of your mind, think, right, who am I going to go and talk to? Do I know somebody to add to this column or do I not know anybody? So I'm going to have to search and ask people and network to find people to talk to. Uh, and then you ring them and then you wait. I then wait another couple of days and then I write it. And then, and, and as I said, I, you know, I write what I think is perfect and it always comes back so much better, thanks to generally Yanina, um, that, that, uh, or that, 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 so it comes back uh, well and off it goes and then you get some, and I'm also checking how engaged are the readers with it because readers give some fabulous answers as well. Um, I tend not to read theirs until after I've written mine. Uh, but the rest of the day, the day job, if you like, in the university, um, it's a combination of strategic thinking and trying to keep your eye on big projects that are going on that are going to take a few years or a year or two or, or new schemes that are going on and also of course it is a department of 30 people it's seeing students it's seeing uh, colleagues around the university so there's all that to be done as well and uh, Jonathan, I think um, starting from uh, uh, an engineer ca career and then of course um, changing jobs as you said, has not been easy. I I would love to better understand what skill set did you take in all the different jobs that you have done that you think that you're applying today in your current job. So I think we were talking about problem solving and analytical thinking, but then If I understood well, when you talked about a startup, I guess you needed to bring a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. Yes, and, and finance. I learned a lot in management consultancy. Yeah. <clears throat> and two of the key things were um, the sin of omission is worse than the sin of commission. So it's far more important to just tell people everything that's going on, being very open, so that everyone is then aware of what's going on. Um, and the other mantra I learned from that was the no pride in ownership. So... You can't say... I, I, I remember the first time I got to Oxford and I'd written a paper for some uh, committee and somebody came to me and said, I hope you don't mind, but I've made some changes. And I said, don't mind. I think it's fantastic that you've added your yeah. part and somebody else can't. I know, but that's not, uh, that's not common. People get very, but this is, I've written this perfectly, this is right. And that, and that way you never really learn and develop uh, and keep growing. So those were two things that I picked up from there. Um, learn how to work hard. Um, I mean, obviously, obviously, university you work hard, but the consultancy you work even hard. I mean, you've got deadlines, uh, just like journalists have deadlines that that clock just keeps running. Um, so you learn how to do that and then to balance all of that out. What would you recommend to someone that is, you know, at the um, uh, first decade of their career, they are doing a career move, they want to do a career move, and uh, they say, but I've built something meaningful in uh, this consulting for firm or um, in this um, software engineering firm, and now I want to have a career move. I'm going to change industry. I want to bring this new skill set uh, and learn something new, and my past skill set, I want to apply it. But how you don't lose Uh, that connections that you built maybe in uh, five years or so with a past company? Huh. I think we've had a couple of Dear Jonathan questions along those lines of people who say, I want to move into a different industry yeah. um, or and bring skills to another industry I rather fancy. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we had one of somebody who was in uh, um, uh, commodity broking and wanted to move, I believe, and wanted to move into film and media. I mean, but but bring those skills. So, First of all, don't don't jump instantly. You know, this is a this is going to be a research project, just like a project at work, except it's got the most important part of it, which is you, um, and the most important thing you've ever had to market, which is again you. Um, but take it as a research project. I mean, it's what we would tell students. You know how to do research. Well, this is quite important research now, which is you know, what is the industry about? Where can I get help? How can I learn about the industry before I even think any further? Then it's who can I go and talk to. Who's ideally made the same move as me? 
um, that I'm thinking about, and let's get it warts and all. Who made the move and came back again because it didn't work? I want to understand that. Nothing's going to be perfect. Um, so then it's all about information interviews uh, and about, you know, could you spare 20 minutes and tell me what it's like to be a podcast host and yeah, see what, yeah. what are the... It, it means not all just like this. There's lots of background work that you have to do. So I want to understand about that. And then it's now we're down to the... Tra having made the strategic decision and at some point... Um, you have pulled in lots and lots of data about the role, but at some point you've got to jump in the cold swimming pool. You, you, you'll never know everything, and that can unsettle some people, uh, but others are cool with that, saying, well, it feels... I mean, actually, every job move I've made, um, I haven't really learned enough about what I was getting into, and within a few weeks thinking, crikey, God. <laughs> but it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. We're human, we're adaptable, we're resilient, we can, we can move and... And sometimes you just got to do it. Uh, we just need to be a bit more confident in uh, in ourselves, I guess. Well, I think you have to know yourself about what, how comfortable you are with what level of, of risk, what level of change. And of course, you may have a mortgage and family and other people dependent on you, or you may have caring responsibilities and other things that you need to take account of. You're not a complete island of um, being able to work that. But in the end, if you're beginning to become unhappy about things, then then sometimes you do have to put yourself first and say, I'm going to move and don't worry, guys, it's going to be fine. And uh, I guess in terms of like a skill set that you would suggest younger people to develop today, what would it be for you the best piece of advice to be the younger people to be fully prepared in the spectrum of you know skills to be ready for a good job move okay so what do empl employers look for specifics and for general um, attributes the specifics say journalism um, uh, would be what student newspapers are you writing for what blog are you writing we need to see evidence that you are serious about this and you've been doing it um, and, and you've been working on that for not just the last 20, you know, the last month or so, but you've, you've, you're really invested in this. You do read a lot of papers, you read a lot of blogs, you read, you know, you, so you know the, and you've read some books around it as well uh, about how to be a journalist. Um, and then on the generic side, it, it, it's back to what we said. It's about being energetic and curious and um, and then the skills that employers are really looking for, the number one is teamwork, mm -hmm. that you can work well in a team, um, uh, leadership, communication, um, technical skills, but in a way everyone's got those now. But And you can demonstrate those uh, not having... And don't feel... Uh, students shouldn't feel they've had to have worked in a business. You can get teamwork by organising the basketball club or by putting on a show, or by, you know, working in church, or volunteering with a, uh, you know, um, a food bank or something. So you can demonstrate all sorts of skills from another part of the world. Um, you know, your life is not divided between work and life. It's all one. And employers are very happy with that. So especially when you're a student and you haven't had many opportunities yet. And we don't really want to be going back to the th uh, school uh, to well, when I was you know seventeen, I organised the football club. Yeah. I mean, we we can do stuff now, but so that if you were a student, that's what I'd be preparing is those sorts of how am I going to demonstrate teamwork and business awareness and um, uh, yeah communication leadership, the usual sort of employability skills. In terms of uh, recommending uh, younger people that are listening uh, to us right now, in uh, uh, keep learning. I think uh, when you're out of university and you start a job, you're so focused on delivering one project, following what your manager is asking you, uh, ticking a few boxes. But how do you keep learning outside of a realm of uh, your, your the, the remit of your job and uh, your job description? So the formal learning of uh, evening classes or online courses particularly, you know, you don't need to pay for online courses if your Excel skills are weak. There's gazillion YouTube videos or on SPSS or statistical analysis, whatever. So you can do a lot of that yourself, self-directed. But I think the more important learning is, is observing people around you, especially managers, going to lectures, going to talks and reflecting why am I not enjoying this? Why is this not going well? What would I have done differently with that talk? 
Why is that manager, that was brilliant. How did they manage to persuade those three people to do something that they weren't very happy with? So I think that's why uh, I, I might be a bit um, unfavourable here, which yeah. is being back in the office yeah. uh, and, and being around people yeah. and seeing how people work, because those are the skills yeah. I think you pick up. And, I, and a lot of wisdom I've picked up has been working with um, uh, uh, amenable and difficult bosses as to, you know, both sorts, as to say, why did that work and why did that not work? And, and then reflecting on it and thinking, I'm, actually, that's a great um, uh, approach. I'm going to mimic that. I'm going to use those, uh, those ways of dealing with it. And that is something I'm going to try not to do. Uh, How do you keep track of all these inspirations that you find around? Do you have a notebook or something? Often... I mean, they're all there, I'm sure, in the unconscious. So then the trick is you've got to free up the unconscious mind, um, which you do by distracting it. You distract the unconscious, which is where all those other ideas about networking and all those other people you should go and talk to are, are brilliant things. Um, so you have to distract yourself with a, a job that only requires half your mind, which is why people have a lot of the best ideas in the shower, cutting the grass, doing the ironing, doing the washing up. Stuff you don't really need your whole conscious brain on because you've done it you know, a lot of times. And then suddenly you'll think, crikey, how, how did I forget that? Or if I'm, um, as I said, like on the, uh, on the Dear Jonathan column, I, I'll be cycling around thinking about it and then suddenly, oh yeah, I should talk to X or that would be a great way to start that column. So I think it's it's getting a bit distracted. Um, I don't know why, Jonathan, but uh, the more I'm listening to you, the more um, it looks like um, I'm listening to um, a kind of an anthropologist. Um, I think I would summarize that in I'm always curious about people's motivation. And often the Dear Jonathan questions are all about their motivation. What's going on here? Why? I mean, the, 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 the issue you've put before us is not the real issue here. It's the one underneath. It's the what's driving this. And that's always fascinating. I mean, sometimes people don't know what that is. But yeah. uh, How do you prepare yourself? What have you been reading and studying to, to, to do your job? Um, in terms of books to read, you know, I, well, I pick up things like NLP books or um, transactional analysis. I mean, you can take pieces out of these things to think, oh, yeah, that's what's going on in like the drama triangle, yeah. uh, which people can operate in at times. Um, it just helps you to understand or to distance yourself and step back a bit and say, before I get sucked into this, what's actually what's going on here? Okay, Jonathan, thank you so much. If there is one thing about this podcast is uh, always uh, opening up the podcast uh, studio to some bright young minds out there. And to today we have uh, Crystal and Gia joining us. Uh, Crystal, where are you coming from? What have you started? Uh, tell us a bit about you. Hi, so um, I'm Crystal. I'm currently a second year accounting and finance student at King's College London. Um, Yeah, so we're... Yeah, and uh, what uh, what is your question for Jonathan today? Um, yeah, so I'm actually coming on behalf of the King's College London Bame in the City Society. So we are actually a student community that also helps students to provide them support with early career development. Mm -hmm. So um, my question to Jonathan is that FIRE, financial independence, retire early, has been a term that has been hotly debated for The, you know, the several years and now that more and more people are considering taking on mini retirements instead, um, which can sound like a huge setback in career like advancement. So my question is, is taking a mini retirement always detrimental to one's career development or there are any potential benefits to that? And if someone is actually considering taking a few months or a few years off work for a mini retirement, What kind of advice would you like offer to them to balance between their career goals and personal aspirations? Great question. I think it starts with um, the two words you said at the beginning about being financially independent. You don't necessarily then have to retire early. Um, as you'll have probably picked up from the, the rest of the podcast, I just think there are too many interesting things to do in the world to step back completely and just, you know, lotus eat on the beach Uh, even if you are financially independent. So why not put that to great use? Um, and it could just, uh, even an unpaid role of um, 
uh, of influence or working with uh, charities, voluntary organizations, or something that's close to your values like sustainability or biodiversity or um, poverty or li early literacy or something like that. So um, none of which are definitely career in, um, uh, for a specific career, but they'll always be great. And it'll also um, open you up to new things that are out there in the world. So, but I mean, it's great to be in a position to be financially independent, um, if only. Uh, but um, maybe not yet. I did meet somebody once uh, at an alumni event in New York who said, well, I've, you know, I, I'm financially independent from this company now. And, um, what, you know, what can I do? Because I, this I want to work for this charity, but they won't pay me enough. And I said, hang on a minute. You just said you're independent. It's a charity. Come on. Like, go and help. Um, uh, but no, he, he still wants to be paid because, you know, there is an element of uh, um, uh, that's how I'm valued in society. But if you're financially independent, I think it, I think you're right. You're, the hint is it would be detrimental to a career. And given you don't know what the future holds and you may need to get back and get another job and get paid again, it would be uh, you might as well go and do something. But what a great opportunity to go and do something you've always dreamt of doing, like saving turtles or... Uh, or building homes for homeless people in Sudan or something like that and then come back. But always be they would be great things to talk about when you're going back for the next job. Or you could become a journalist or you could become a, you know, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Crystal, and thank you, Jonathan. Gia, over to you and uh, tell us a bit more uh, about you. Yep, so my name is Jalin. I'm also a second year accounting and finance student. So we both represent the KCL BAME Society today. And I'm also like the secretary of the King's College London Malaysian Society. So my question for you today is, given that it is daunting to find your first job and the transition from university to your first job, it is kind of scary to everyone. So what advice will you give to a fresh grad when given a career opportunity, how will you make sure that it is the career for them and is suited for their future career development? Um, well, you can't be certain it's right. And that's the beauty of life, is, is that um, the future is uncertain. Um, as long as it feels about right and, it, you, and you are ready to move, I mean, it's the old aphorism about... Um, the bird sitting on the branch of the tree uh, is confident, not because uh, she, the branch is strong, but because she has wings and can fly off if the branch breaks. And that's the same with, you know, students or with anybody taking a job is if, if something goes wrong, you can always leave and go get another. Um, uh, there was um, there is a feeling sometimes amongst students of this job has to be perfect or I won't take it. And certainly about five years ago, there was a spate of until the job is perfect. You know, I won't, I, I won't take it. But um, you, you think of it like a sailing trip where you're going to tack from one job to another across the bay of life. Um, but you do have to put the sails up and leave the harbour and, and start a job and think, OK, so what am I going to get out of this job? I'm going to get experience. I'm going to get something on the CV. I'm going to learn from people. And, you know, if it lasts a couple of years, that, that's great. I've got started. I've got the sailing trip. I've left the harbour. Um, so don't, don't expect perfection. I've also met students who say, oh, but, um, but this job I'm going to take, uh, you know, I could be stuck in it for 30 years. I say, well, well you're not a prisoner. I mean, you can, you're not a slave. You can leave um, and go, and you probably will because you'll develop, the jobs will develop, the environment develops, things change, you meet partners, they want to go and live in New York or in Bangkok or something, and off you'll go. So, um, but just to get started and don't worry about it being perfect. I've also met a student once who, who said, I don't want to waste any time in my career. I want to go, um, you know, I want it all planned out so I don't waste time. And I said, what you mean, until you're 65? And he said, yes. I said, well... A, that sounds quite boring, that you've planned everything. There'll be no surprises along the way. And, um, and B, I've got a terrible thing to tell you, which is life isn't like that. Life will throw things in the path and you'll think, wow, that's a great opportunity. I'll go do that. Um, I think, again, uh, earlier in the podcast, I think um, you, you were certainly getting the feeling that I've moved around a lot yeah. as opportunities have turned up because there's lots of interesting things to do in the world 
and we're not all here just to do one well some people are they mean but even no and like um uh, my wife my son they're both medics but medicine is a huge career so it's not just being a doctor because you could do academic research you could be a specialist you could be a pre-hospital you could be gp all sorts of different things so even if you think i really want to do this there's lots of choices along the way so i think keeping yourselves open to that but uh, but go and get started and and develop it taking those those skills you've got those original employability skills so Nothing, nothing to be anxious about here. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. And of course, thank you so much, Jonathan. I hope you enjoyed uh, your time with us. I certainly did. This has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent Team, Aya Al-Shihabi, and me, Virginia Stani. Our podcast producer, editor and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa, and our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time, and keep listening. Interested in going to business school? I have a suggestion for you today. You can get the best advice from admission centers and officers and successful alumni with a new newsletter from the Financial Times. MBA 101, a new weekly email series. You can learn everything you need to know about applying for the best MBA programs out there in just six weeks. Sign up MBA 101 on the Financial Times website.